Uh, we, I want to thank you so much for coming out in the snow today. Um, the weather is cold. I'm sure the people in Florida are so jealous right now. They are losing their minds, wanting to move back, um, come shovel and wear big coats um, because this is the place to be, right? Come on now. This is where we live. This is where God called us. We are happy. We love this place. Listen, I want to just take you back to this beautiful handout that um, you can get at the door, probably under your seats. We are halfway through our journey of fasting and prayer for those who are uh, new to the term fasting and prayer. Fasting is simply going out with enough food so that it creates a hum in your life that's undeniable to remind you to focus on Jesus in a more specific way during the 14 days. We have different activities tonight at 6.30, all of our small group leaders, our uh, uh, surf leaders, our staff, are gonna be gathering at Greece campus at 6.30, and last week it was spectacular. And then on Wednesday night, for those who were here this past Wednesday, this place was packed, and it was spectacular. It was absolutely amazing. And all the things that we are doing is literally putting practices, rituals, and routines, spiritual rituals, rat, routines, so that we understand that those things shapes how we love. Giving to God shapes how you love God. That's why we constantly say God doesn't want money from you. He wants money for you. Because when we give, it shapes who and what we love. And so this coming Wednesday, we have a worship leader coming off all the way from things Fort Lauderdale. He was Pastor Jensen Franklin's worship leader for quite a while. And he's going to be here. His name's Rory. I can't pronounce his last name. Um, and it's going to be absolutely spectacular. Then on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, we had such a large group of people out in our venue across the street. I taught on the literal baby steps into how to pray, the language of prayer. Nobody is born knowing how to pray. And it was a phenomenal journey. As my son said to me, it's the first time somebody demystified prayer for me because I was given language how to communicate with God. And I'm going to continue that teaching this coming um, Saturday morning. And I want to encourage you, if you've not jumped on, this is a good time for you to do so. Uh, so I would love for us just to appreciate our worship teams, our volunteers, and those who's been here since 6.30 this morning. Come on. We are so deeply thankful for them where they are serving. Father, oh, we stand in awe of your saving grace. Jesus, where the family gathers, the Father speaks. And give us ears to hear, hearts that are responsive in a loud yes. Save us from religion. Save us from going through the motions, but never experience the awakening and the transformation where we can say, I was blind, but now I can see. I was dead, but I've been made alive. Thank you that no matter what we have done this week, that your loving kindness, oh, is new every morning. You're slow to anger and rich in love. So may we experience the gathering in of your sons and daughters through the grace of heaven. That is my prayer right now, in Jesus' name, amen. So today, I want to talk to you about the power of prayer. Uh, it's in our series, Living by Prayer. And the, the, the interesting part is, I was wrestling uh, to, to stick with the power of prayer because I think the topic, this is how I fight my battles, um, would be a better description of this. I would love to read to you a portion of scripture, but before I do, I want to tell you a story uh, there is a lady, her name is Mary Lou Quillen. She has now written a book about her experience that you can look up and pick up, and I'm sure you will enjoy it. Um, her mom passed away in 2006, yep. 
And for those of you who have lost someone as close as a mom and dad, you know that it is very, very hard, no matter their age. And so when um, she, uh, they went through the, the funeral and um, the, the whole mourning and the pain around it, uh, some people call it a second death when you've got to go to the home and pack up someone's life. Because literally, it is like the end of a Monopoly game. You've got to take the money, take the houses, take get out of jail free card, take out the community chest, take the hotels, put it all back in the box. Because you do know that our lives, guaranteed, all of us, our lives will be picked up, packed away in a box one day. And so the traumatic experience of what do we give, what do we keep, what do we remember them by, and what do we throw away is really traumatic, but necessary. And so she was cleaning a cupboard, and all of a sudden a box fell out, and as the box fell out, it split open, well, the top actually came out, um, and a whole bunch of paper just strewed all over the floor. Very curiously, she bent down and picked up a piece of paper, and she opened it, and it said this, um, God, would you help Robert get a job? Robert's her son. She picked up the next one. God, would you help me with my health? And she began to realize these were all the prayers that her mom prayed. And she looked at the box, and on the box it said, God Box 2006. And, and, and then, she, with curiosity, she opened the closet, the cupboard, and she saw this was one of multiple boxes stacked away. Her mom had a box for every year for the longest time that she called the God box. And the simplicity of the God box is that she would write prayers and she would deposit it into the God box and put it in God's hand. So she was able to take all the prayers that her mom prayed and begin to see the astonishing amount of praise that God answered over the years of what her mom prayed. So what we have created, and you'll hear a little bit more of it, is our own Father's house, God box. Because what we believe is a very beautiful practice, as I said this to our staff, it is interesting that most religions have spiritual practices. Uh, the Muslim religion has Fridays, and the country I come from, um, there was a lot of business people that were Muslim. And Friday is the busiest time where you can make the most money. But they will close shop, take their sons, go to the mosque, and they would pray. Because it was a spiritual practice that shaped the love for what they believe. And we would love to introduce the opportunity for you to obtain one of these boxes in our cafe areas, our lobby areas. Because wouldn't it be great? if this is our God box for 2006. That you too can begin the practice of not only you, but your family putting in a primary place and beginning to fill the God box idea with prayer. Because prayer changes the tide of life. And I want to speak to you about that very subject. Now, um, you know you're my favorite service to preach to, right? You do know that. Don't tell the other people that come to the first service. If your cousin isn't there, don't tell your cousin. He's going to stop coming to church because you guys preach with me. That's what I love about this. So I'm going to encourage you uh, to get into the next uh, section that I'm going to be reading to you. And uh, it's, it's a few verses, so um, you can read along. You don't have to read it out loud. Then I can read through it. Uh, Exodus chapter 17, verse 8 to 15 says, While the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, Choose some men to go out and fight the army of the Amalek for us. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill, holding the staff of God in my hand. Now remember that part. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of the nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hands, the Israelites had the advantage. That was on the battlefield. But... Whenever he dropped his hand, 
the Amalekites gained the advantage on that battlefield. Now, Moses' arms soon became so tired, he could no longer hold them up. That is the staff. And, and so Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. Uh, then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands, so his hands was steady until sunset. This was an all-day battle for Joshua, an all-day prayer for Moses. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in the battle. Now, this portion I would in like to invite you to read with me out loud. Come on, verse 14. After the victory... The Lord instructed Moses, write this down on a scroll as a permanent reminder and read it out loud to Joshua. I will erase the memory of Amalek from under the heaven. Moses built the altar there and named it Yahweh Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. There is a few things that I want you to grab and hold on that I'm going to explain to you. Be because you see, it is interesting after this whole scenario that God instructs Moses, write it down and read it to Joshua as a reminder. Because God already knew that Joshua was going to lead the people. God already knew that Joshua was going to fight not only one battle, but many battles. And I believe what God was saying is, let me teach you a pattern how to win your battles. Uh, write it down, follow the patterns, and you will have victory every single time you encounter the enemy. Now, here is something that we, we, as, as believers um, in, in, in Christ, um, that we need to understand that um, it's interesting. Let me put it you this way. When Israel was slaves in Egypt, there was no recorded battle that they ever had to fight. But the moment they pulled out of slavery and on their way to the promised land, they had to fight 10 cities and multiple nomadic tribes. The, the Amaleks were a nation that prayed on the nomadic tribes and Israel was traveling. So can I just say this to you today, that I believe that when you find yourself in a place of compromise and bondage and sin, that's probably the most destructive but the most comfortable living you'll ever have. Because the moment you choose to walk in the direction of God's promise, you will have opposition, you will have an enemy, you will have discouragement, you will have... So, so I'm here to tell you that the notion that when I'm going through hard things is a sign that God is not with me is actually foolish. When you go through hard things is a sign you are on your journey to the promise of God. And, and, and we have got to just be okay with battles. We've got to be okay with opposition because our God promises us if you follow this pattern, you will slay the enemy every single time. Now, there's another thing about Amalek that's quite interesting. And if you're interested, you can read in Deuteronomy 25 verse 17 because it says this is how the, the Amalekites will attack you. They will attack you from behind and they will attack the weak and the stragglers, which means is the people that fall out of the bunch. Can I say this to you that I believe that we are at our most susceptible to the attacks of the enemy when we are tired, when we are weary, and when we are disconnected from community of people who know our name and can pray for us, look you in the eye and say, how are you? And you know you cannot lie because they know you. Because no enemy will attack you in the bunch. He comes from the place where the stragglers and the weary and the weak is so I'm just going to say this if you violate the Sabbath you don't get proper rest you open yourself to become weak and weary and the enemy will attack you and he will nail you and steal God's promise for your life so I know a lot of you right now go like well I don't believe in a devil it's okay just start walking to the promise of God you will meet him on the way it is okay. You don't have to believe me. I don't have to make a case for it. Just live life with your eyes fixed on Jesus and you will know. But this is what I want you to know. I do not believe the devil is responsible for everything. 
the house I grew up in Sunday, the, the, the lamb, lamb burned. My mom goes, oh, the devil burned the lamb. The devil didn't burn the lamb, the oven burned the lamb. You kept it in there too long. Oh, the devil, give me a flat tire. No, he didn't. He's actually not even near your home right now. You just got a flat tire because life is life. So I don't want to be so extreme and say everything's the devil, but here is the danger that we sit today, that we've moved so far to the other extreme that we don't even think we have an enemy that we don't even understand there is someone with deliberate plans uh, to, to diffuse you, destroy you, um, isolate you, compromise you, because he knows you in the pathway of right, rightness on the, on the path to God's promise is a potent threat to his kingdom, and he will want to stop you at any and all times and in any way he can. But... This is how we fight our battles. So there are three things that I would love for you to write down. This is the message where you should take out your smartphone, but first put up your right hand and say, I will not go on Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, um, LinkedIn. I will not do it. Jesus is watching. You can only be in notes of your phone, okay? Only in notes. Here is the first thing that I would love for you to um, write down. But let me read to you a beautiful quote that uh, author C.S. Lewis said. Check out this beautiful quote. He says, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Can I say this to you? We read historically of Amalek. They didn't just kill the men, take the women and the children as their war uh, reward. They killed the men, the women, children born, and children unborn, and even the old people. Why? Because Amalek was determined to stop the legacy of a believing nation. Can I say this to you? If God has given you the gift of babies, you better know how to fight your battles. Because the enemy is after your children. Because if he can cause your children to live compromised bondage life, faith stops with you. There is no one carrying it to the next generation. And I believe with all of my heart, our hope for the future is that our sons and daughters will carry the torches of our conviction and our faith. And it will blaze with even more power, more conviction, with more strength. Because right now as I am standing here, and if you, you would you hear my dad preach, I I am carrying his legacy. I'm carrying his torch. But I'm growing older, and my son and my daughter needs to carry it, and they are in a magnificent way, and God wants your children. But can I tell you this? I stand in the battle for my family every single day because I know the enemy is determined to sidetrack them away from the cause of Jesus and the call of Christ for their life. This is how we fight our battle. So there are three things. The very first thing that we see in this battle is the intervention of the supernatural power of God. The second thing that we see in this battle is Moses on the mountain in the posture of prayer. The third thing we see in battle is Joshua on the battlefield, and Scripture calls Joshua a skilled warrior. Come on, just say that with me, skilled warrior. Now, you, you do know when we talk about battle, we're not talking about going somewhere and buying a samurai sword or a shotgun. Or, we, we're not talking about this battle because the Bible says the battle that you and I face is an invisible battle. It's a spiritual battle. Behind the people that are coming at you and making life hard, sometimes there is some force, some spirit, some funk behind them. You're not fighting them. You are fighting what's inspiring them, what's ex escalating them. We, we, we're not fighting addiction. We are fighting the spirit of bondage behind the addiction. That's what we are fighting. So the, the skill of Joshua I, when I began to think about it, the only word that I could come up with that is comparable, that I say this is what it means to have a skill when you're going through tough times, is the word wisdom. Come on, shout wisdom. Because this is the part that is so dreadful that I have seen over the years. If, 
as I've counseled people, love people, many people want to put a disproportionate, uh, 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 a disproportionate uh, load on God, nothing on themselves, and then they act foolishly all the time. In other words, I don't pray, and I'm just being absolutely, I want to use the word stupid, is that okay? I, I don't want that to sound derogatory. I'm not saying you stupid, I'll speak about me. I can be utterly stupid when I don't connect myself to the mountain and to the God of the heavens. In other words, you say things, you do things. So here's my question as you are sitting in this place. How do you fight your battle? How is the wisdom that you have in that moment? Because uh, I'm a pastor, I can tell you how I think some of you fight your battle. You become passive aggressive. You say nothing. You become like a tomb. You say nothing. You walk in and you eat your Fritos in the morning. You leave your bowl. Your wife says, how are you? You pretend she doesn't exist. That's you. That's how you fight your battle. That is foolish. It's manipulative. It's cowardly. Because you don't want to sort it out. Now you want to use silent manipulation to put pain and burden on the family. The others, your fuse are this short. You come up the driveway, the dog smells it first. Because they can. Dog is freaking running. The cat is following. You come through the door the way you open the door. The kids know all hell's about to break. And now your wife is trying to run around you, honey, honey, honey. And you love that kind of attention. I'm here to tell you this is not how you fight your battle. It is foolish. It is manipulative. It is evil. And as you can see, I'm only speaking to the men because I know how men fight the battle. Women are probably a whole different other game. When you fight your battle, do you phone friends? And distort the story and go like, if you love me, you'll stand with me. Is that how you fight your battle? Or do you go on Twitter and in a few words, subtly, you are bombarding with so much in innuendos? Or are you bold enough to take a picture of your spouse and go like, why did I even marry him? Uh, is that how you fight your battle? How do you fight your battle? Because the first thing that you need to acquire is wisdom. Because wisdom on the battlefield, prayer on the hill, ushers in the presence of God that changes the momentum in the situation that you are in. Can I get an amen? Yeah. So let's see what scripture says about wisdom. Proverbs 4 verse 6. Come on, Greece Campus Extension Services. Read with me. It says this. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you, love her, and she will watch over you. Stop right there. When I read this, it's amazing. When Solomon writes about wisdom, he uses the feminine gender, feminine turn. And I'm like, why does he call her a she? I've been married almost 30 years. I understand why he uses the word she. Because how many guys, how many times do you tell your wife, your wife says, you know I'm right. You go like, no, no, you know you're all right. Uh, just give it a week and you come back and you go like, baby, you were right. And so, it's a she, she says she. And the beginning of wisdom is this. What is it? What's the beginning of wisdom? No, 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 it's not hard. It's on the screen. The beginning of wisdom is? Go, oh, come on, shout it out. The beginning of wisdom is? You do it again. The beginning of wisdom is? You are not born with wisdom. You are born with common sense. You are not born with wisdom. Wisdom, you cannot Google. You can Google information. So do not go Google, how do I fight fair? No, don't do that. Because you don't need information and coaching how to fight fair. You need wisdom to defuse the bomb in your home. That's what you need. You need wisdom to defuse the compl complexity in your own life. So where do we get wisdom? The Bible dedicated a whole book to wisdom. It's the book of Proverbs, and in this month, let me encourage you to read the book of Proverbs. And I want to say this every single time somebody tells me, I read the Bible, but I don't understand it. You've got to shut down the voice that tells you that nonsense. The Bible was not written to confuse you. Read Proverbs. What you actually are saying, what I read, I don't agree with. 
I don't like it because it's unconventional to the culture. Let me give you an idea. The Bible says, if you have an enemy, the culture says, mm, talk about them, gossip about them, discredit them, tweet about them, create a fake account and do things with them and <clears throat> wish them terrible things and get a doll and stick a pin in the kneecap. Do something. <laughs> you know what scripture says, if you have an enemy and they're thirsty, give them water. If you have an enemy, be kind to them. It's fiery coals on their head. In other words, I'm warning you that the wisdom that God gives is anti-culture. And it will take courage. Sometimes it makes no sense. It may cause you. It will call you to wash the feet of the people who hate you. But God knows when you do the wisdom of heaven and you are on the mountain connected to the power of God, it will diffuse the situation in your life. Here's my question. How? do you fight your battle and have you inquired wisdom when you stand in the battle oh James 1 5 says if anyone lacks wisdom you should ask God who gives generously when you say God I do not know what to do my kids are driving me insane I'm gonna lose my mind raise your hands and say God give me wisdom that's smarter than their smarts oh God give me wisdom that will figure out how to wisely stand in the gap and wisely create an on-ramp back to the love of Jesus Jesus for them. Here is the second thing. Not only was it the wisdom in the battlefield, it was also the power of God that was ready to intervene in the momentum in the battle. There is a powerful scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 4. Come on, let's, let's read it out loud. Everybody, make me so happy and let's read it out loud. And Naji, you can come. David, you can come. It, it goes like this. Deuteronomy 20 verse 4. For the Lord, your God, is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you what? Can I remind you that God's desire is to give you a victory and God's victory is not to destroy others and save you. God's victory is to heal the whole mess. God is not out to get some and not others. Our God is not a getting God. If our God was a getting God, we would have been gotten, all of us, long time ago. God doesn't heal one and hurt another. Our God brings restoration. Even if wrong was committed, He's a restorative God. But God's willingness in heaven and the skillful battle where life was on the line had a link and a connection. It was Moses on the mountain in the posture of prayer. Oh, this is so good. Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, here's the best part, don't, don't fall asleep, right? Come back, come back, this is the best part, this is the best part. Remember, the Bible, Bible says that he held the staff high, he had a staff in his hand. This is a, this is a very important thing for you to understand. Moses uh, was a shepherd. And that was the staff that he carried. What, what is the staff? It's his strength over the sheep he was leading. That's why it's called the shepherd's staff. If he wants to gather the sheep, he takes his staff. It's his strength. It's the extended strength of his life. And he taps them. In other words, it was the strength of his ability to control the sheep. When he came to the burning bush. If you've never read the story, go read it. Exodus, uh, end of Genesis, Exodus, you'll find it there. It, it is so beautiful. Or just watch the Disney movie, it's in there. And, and, and he's holding the staff and, and he's standing and, and he hears Moses, right, remember? And take off your shoes, Moses. And it's like, oh, the wind's blowing and the fire. And, and then in the midst of this, God says, throw down the staff. It's my best God voice. And, and when he threw down the staff, what happened to the staff? It turned into a serpent, a viper. You know what God was revealing? Moses, let me show you the nature of your strength. It's poisonous. It's manipulative. It's controlling. I cannot work through your strength. Then he says this, pick the viper up by his tail. Let me ask you this, which is the weak side of the snake? 
Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, it's not hard. You, it's, not, it's really not hard. You should watch Discovery Channel. If you don't know that answer, I'm worried. I'm really worried. The tail, the tail, the tail, the, the, the other side is that bites you. In other words, what God is saying to him, I want you to pick up your strength at its weak side. Because you see, if you pick up your strength at the weak side, you will never have confidence in your strength. You will always realize God will use your wisdom, your ability. God will use you. But you've always got to realize in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. Can I tell you what the biggest problem is with most of us? We have yet to cast our staff on the ground and pick it up on the tail. Because you go like, I have lived long enough. I have been through so much crap in my life. I know how to sort people out. You know I am going to, oh, you have no idea who you dealing with. I pick up the phone and call the mayor. You'll never work in this city again. You viper, you. You viper. Because you are saying, I know people and I have strength. And really? Can I tell you something? You will never get God to fight for you if you are fighting in your own strength for yourself. Never in a million years. God opposes the proud, but he exalts the humble. It's when you realize, even if I think I can handle it, God, I will get on my knees and I will lay down my strength and what I think. And I'm going to raise my hand because the first thing I need is you in the situation, not what I think, not what I think should happen, not what I think they should do, not what I think they should explain or apologize and who's guilty. I'm not going to gossip. I'm not going to make room for the enemy. I'm not going to develop bitterness. I'm not going to let this thing get on the inside of me. God, I know how to fight my battle because I have read what Moses written down for Joshua. And the, all I know is this, they entered the promised land. And God, I am not going to let anybody steal away your promise from my life. Because some of you, if your promise have been stolen because... You can't let things go. So here's Moses on the mountain. And he's got the staff in his hand. Now, when he surrendered that staff, that staff became the finger of God. Some, some, some Bible scholars call it the finger of God. Why? Because that staff, he, he put it on the water and it turned to blood. He put it on the Red Sea it opened. He, he put it on the rock and water came out of the rock in the midst of the desert. It was the finger of God. So here he stands with his hands in the air. And he is praying, and the Bible says when his hands are in the air, he is holding up the staff of God, the finger of God, and he knows we activate the power of God through prayer. You've got, to, you've got to see it. In other words, when I pray, the battle is in my favor. God is active. And when God is active, can I tell you sometimes, sometimes it may not look what you think it should look like. Can I tell you that sometimes when God shows up in your battle, you will just experience a confidence and perseverance more than what you will experience a resolve. Sometimes there is uncommon staying power and courage to just keep steady and keep added. Sometimes it's a change of attitude, how you feel about people. That is God in the battle. Sometimes it's miraculous. Sometimes it's pure wisdom that God gives you how to, to defuse what's in front of you. But we, God showing up the battle doesn't give us just comfort, comfortable places. God showing up in the battle is God active in the battle that will be ongoing in our lives. But every time his hands became weary, which means he stopped praying, then the enemy would begin to find momentum and the battle would change in the enemy's favor. So this one thing I can tell you, that if you are not a praying Christian, you will always be at the mercy of momentum that is against you, not for you. As a church, if we don't pray, we will have momentum against us, not for us. Because the way that the power of God is activated through your life is with your hands in the air and praying. And some of you say, well, I don't know how to pray. That's why I don't pray. Well, then die on the battlefield and blame no one else. 
because nobody else can stand in the gap for you all the time. There is a time that you even look at your five-year-old and say, if that kid on the bus one more time does that to you, swing at him. I will bail you out of prison. Swing, because you need to learn how to stand up and not be pushed around. And can I say this to you? Stop being a victim of your marriage. You've got to learn how to fight the battle for your marriage. Stop blaming your children and giving them names. That's derogatory and go like, they are just millennials and blah, blah, blah. No, this is how we fight our battles to stand and contend for Jesus to be reintroduced in their life and for our prodigals to come back to God. Listen, I, I want to explain to you how I see this work. Matthew Henry says this. He says, when God intends great deliverance for his people, the first thing he does is set them a praying. When God plans great deliverance for your life, somebody has got to pray. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day. Uh, Pastor Rick Warren said it so great, massive church, great impact. He says, the more you pray, the less you will panic. The more you worship, the less you will worry. You feel more patient and less pressured why? Because God is in the battle. So when I was thinking about this, and I, I'm going to end this, I'm going to end this, I'm going to end. Turn to your neighbor and say, five more minutes, just five more minutes, just five more minutes, five more minutes, five. Oh, I love this. I was thinking about this. So David, you've got to help me out. Do, do, the, do the easy one first. Now, when you hear that, it's just the sound. Uh, your heart doesn't race, at least mine doesn't. Because it is just the ebb and flow of life. Because I'm here to tell you, there is not a single day that I can promise you that there will not be the sound of a battle somewhere in your life. Not a single day. Unless you want to go back to bondage, give your life over, and then the enemy has you, he doesn't have to fight you. But there is a different kind of sound. David, do the other one. Okay, how does that make you feel? Can you feel your heart? It's like jaws coming in. Right? Don't, 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 don't. Just feel it, just feel it. It's like your breath is getting short. You feel anxious. You sit in that all day, you're going to lose your mind. You can feel it. It's literally disturbing on the inside. Now, 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 let me teach you something. Now you've got to work with me. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's crazy. So just go with him. Then we get home. He's crazy. Come on, Greece campus. Just tell him. Righteously speaking, he's crazy. He's just insane. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. When we don't pray, this is the sound that surrounds our lives. Constant. You call your family. This is what it sounds like. You go to work. This is what it sounds like. You say good morning to your spouse, and this is what it looks like. Yeah, it is just this noise. Everything is contention. Yeah, you, you ask for tea, and this is what you get. You go like, honey, would you make me coffee? And you get this. You go like, I'll go to Donut, Dunkin' Donuts. You, you know what I mean? This is what you get. But, but you know how you change the sound of this in your life? Come on, everybody, raise your hands. Come on, come on, raise your hands. But when you go like, oh, it sounds cool right now. Everything is so peaceful. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, I don't feel like church and praying. I just, everything is so wonderful. This is, how you won your, this is how you win your battles, church. You, you say to me, I, the sound in my marriage is terrible. Raise your hands. Come before God. Stop fighting your spouse. You guys are beyond healing because you, 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 you are at such a point of differentiation right now. You, 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 you have got to come before God and invite Him into your marriage. And the Bible says, pray without ceasing. 
because the enemy never gets tired. Turn to your neighbor and say, the enemy never gets tired. Come on, play it, David. Keep playing, David. Keep playing, David. The enemy never gets tired. You can't go like, ah, la, 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 la. And no, it doesn't go away. The enemy doesn't get tired. And every drumbeat is the enemy moving closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. Your addiction is coming back. It's moving closer and closer and closer. Uh, your life is becoming all out of focus. It's moving closer. All of a sudden, you read the Bible, and now you want to go with the people that you surround yourself with that say all religions go to the same place and you're beginning to buy into a cultural lie and I'm here to tell you your life is at stake God's plan for your future is at stake your, 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 your existence your legacy is at stake and I don't know about you this is not going to be the story of my life this is not going to be the story of my home this is not going to be the sound in my head this is not going to be the sound in my heart God doesn't want that to be the sound He wants to give you victory He's ready to go because His Bible says He's the captain of hope He's the Lion of Judah that when He roars, all of heaven trembles. The Bible says He holds kings in the palm of His hands like water. He, he, he takes a king off His throne in one day and humbles him and He uplifts those who are weary. Listen, He speaks one word and healing sprouts out. He speaks one word and dark places becomes light. He speaks one word and your prodigal comes home because suddenly they've come to their senses. But it doesn't happen automatically. It always comes as a result of. Come on now. Come on. Give me the D, Anaji. Give me the D. Keep those hands up. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Come on. This is how I fight my back. This is how I fight my back. Come on, everybody. This is how I fight my back. This is how I fight my back. This is how I fight my back. This is how I fight. Why? Why do we do that? Because he's a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on, if you can say that, stand with me and say, Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. This is how I fight my bad. Come on. This is how I fight. Come on, raise your hands, raise your hands, raise your hands. <laughs> Even if you don't understand, it's a posture of surrender. Just sing it again. This is how I fight. This is how I fight. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. Say, it may look like I'm sir. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Come on. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. No matter. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Come on, just raise your hands. I want you to stand in your own battlefield right now. Come on, take yourself there. Take yourself into your secrets. Take yourself into your addictions. Take yourself into your areas of defeat. Take yourself into those areas of struggle, whatever it is, that you go like, this is taking me down. This is taking me down. This is taking me down. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. And say, this is how I fight this battle. 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 This is how I fight. Just one more time, little louder. Say this how I fight this battle. This is how I fight this battle. This is how I fight this battle. 
This is how I fight. Waymaker, come on, here we go. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Come on, church, say. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in. Come on, now it's your turn. All of our campus in extension, let me hear you say. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in. Sing it one last time. Oh, Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in. My God, that. Come on, let me invite you to put your hand on your heart. Everybody, our campuses, station sites where you're sitting. Whisper these words with me. Say, God, give me a praying spirit. Give me a praying spirit. Let my contending be on the mountain, inviting you into the battle. Give me a praying spirit. That is my prayer right now. In Jesus' name, amen.